Hey everyone, uh, Mr. David here. I want to continue on with looking at kind of our more modern U.S. history by taking a look at the 1970s. So the 1970s is going to see the end of the Vietnam War, so we kind of already discussed that. Um, but I'll kind of bring it back up uh, in here just so you can kind of place it um, on kind of the right timeline. Um, and the 70s, a lot of kind of stuff going on. Um, not probably as action-packed as the 60s, but a lot of things uh, going to happen in U.S. society, uh, U.S. foreign affairs, U.S. Cold War, and other things like that. So um, I do want to share that with you. And a lot of what happens in the 1970s is really going to set the foundation for what's going to occur in the 1980s, which is going to be kind of a radical departure from what Americans had found valuable and interesting throughout the, um, you know, 60s, 50s, uh, 40s, and even 1930s. So uh, we're going to see radical departure in the 1980s, and a lot of that's going to have to do with what happens here in the 1970s. So first off, let me just make some kind of super general remarks um, here. Well, remember the 1960s, a lot of changes, so much going on. We know that there were internal things happening within the United States. Uh, there was also really kind of the height of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, Vietnam War, uh, really its peak uh, during the 1960s as well. So uh, many, many things happening. The 1970s is going to see a lot of effects from those changes in the 1960s. So that's going to be uh, something to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, but with that being said, it's still a separate decade. It has its own kind of identity within and of itself. Um, so we'll really want to be looking at that and kind of seeing the big changes occurring, the big things that are going to be happening. One of the big things that happens in the 1970s is really for the first time, that prosperity that had come about after World War II that had really kind of enveloped the United States and the United States was really doing super well from it, um, is really going to slow um, for the first time and really deteriorate. So we're going to look first at kind of like why that's going to happen. And the answer is uh, many reasons, but we'll get into some of those specific things. The 70s, uh, various things going to happen throughout the 70s that's really going to lessen American confidence. This is really going to be confidence of the American people in institutions like the government. Um, also, just kind of their sub superiority. And so when we talk about the 1970s, definitely a time when we're going to see that U.S. invincibility, really, that had kind of been a keystone of uh, the United States, um, is going to fade away from here as well. So this is something else to kind of look at and pay attention to here um, so we can get some better kind of understanding of this. By the way, I just include this picture. This is 1970s Los Angeles. So, um, you know, you can kind of see a lot of similarities to how 1970s Los Angeles looks um, today and then how it looked there. So one of the things that definitely is going to happen throughout the 1970s is economic stagnation, where really we see um, a productivity decline and the U.S. economy not nearly doing as well um, as it had since the post-World War II period. So this graph, by the way, shows that um, in the early part, um, just, you know, kind of how this productivity and the stagnation goes. But we want to talk about some of the reasons why this economic uh, productivity decline will occur. One is going to have to do with the fact that um, the later part of the 60s and the early parts of the 70s are going to see a growth of short-term and temporary jobs and short-term and temporary workers what that kind of means is um, less kind of skilled workers and more people kind of jumping in for a quick buck and then kind of jumping out. So that kind of ruins continuity um, as far as the economy is concerned. The 1970s is also going to see increased costs for businesses due to um, higher levels of government safety and health standards. We'll talk about what exactly that looks like. Um, but Really, the 1970s is a time of really high government regulation when it comes to health standards and safety on the job. And although that's, you know, a good thing, it's a situation that costs more for companies to be able to do, especially when it's first being introduced. So that's going to cause some issues um, as well. 
We can't forget, obviously, about Vietnam and the massive costs incurred from there. I already showed you some of that um, when we actually did the Vietnam lesson, but we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. That, obviously, is going to cause a huge um, issue as far as um, economy is concerned. And you'll remember the fact that that's money that's being spent overseas that's not going to be able to be spent back at home, so that's problematic as well. The 1970s is going to see increased oil prices, um, and by the 1970s, the United States is definitely importing far more oil than it's using from actually at home, um, so that's going to cause some issues and some, pro some problems there. We'll see very much inflation become apparent. We saw inflation develop because of Vietnam. That inflation is going to increase. Um, the increase of prices is going to lead to an increased cost of living, so um, it's going to be much harder for people to be able to live comfortably, so definitely something we want to be uh, paying attention to, and definitely something that's been different since really the end of the World War II period. I also want to stress that U.S. overconfidence definitely led to issues because of the fact that the United States has kind of such a good economic situation following World War II, it's going to mean that they're not going to improve enough. And other countries who weren't as fortunate after World War II by the 1970s are going to be improving and surpassing the United States. A really great example of that is the U.S. auto industry. And the U.S. auto industry had really been the dominant auto industry by far in the country. People bought American, General Motors, Chevy, Ford, etc. But by the 1970s, uh, Japanese and uh, German cars w started to become a lot more popular. And it was one of those things where they really developed their technology as far as um, how they built cars. So what you had was oftentimes a more reliable car, a... Um, more cost-effective car and things like that. And the U.S. auto industry, because it had been at, at such a high, uh, really didn't improve enough to match up to that. So you can still kind of know that today, even though obviously the American auto industry is still good. You think about how many people buy, you know, Toyotas versus Chevys or, um, you know, BMWs and Mercedes um, as opposed to American kind of uh, cars. So interesting to look at there. Another look to kind of explain the economic issues, and this is um, inflation, and I'll actually bring this up later on because we're going to see a spike in inflation um, in the early 70s, and then it will kind of fizzle, and then at the late 70s, we see a huge spike um, as well up into like the 13-ish percent, uh, which is obviously really not good. Standard inflation is, is around like 3%, um, so that, that obviously is problematic. Okay, as far as foreign policy, there's going to be a really big thing that happens here in the uh, 1970s, and it has to do with China. So let me explain this. Um, if you recall, in 1949, we saw the Chinese Revolution, where Mao Zedong was able to become the leader of China, and in it, establish a communist China. Essentially, right away, when China becomes communist, they're going to end U.S.-Chinese relations. No trade, no diplomatic relations, and that's going to be the case up until the early 1970s. However, if you want to talk about kind of the world and what things, what was kind of going on and how things were developing, something really interesting occurred, which is that in the greater Cold War, um, the Chinese and the Soviet Union started to have a massive conflict develop. And it's really interesting because when China became communist, there was kind of this idea that they were going to be best friends with the Soviet Union. They were going to kind of try to promote this kind of greater world communism. They'd be on the same team, kind of. And that is actually not what's going to happen at all. And by the late 60s, early 70s, that conflict had really become brutal between the two sides uh, to the point where they were actually fighting each other on their border in a variety of kind of hard to say wars, but, you know, skirmishes and things like that. Nixon is going to see this as the president. He's going to say, you know what, it's time to capitalize on this conflict here. It's time to kind of come in here and use this feuding between the Soviet Union and, and China in order to maybe get something better for us. What's really interesting about this is this is actually in 1971, 1972, 
So this is when the United States is trying to get out of Vietnam. But if you remember, Nixon's advocating peace with honor. He doesn't want to leave and South Vietnam to dissipate. So he wants to make sure that when they leave, you know, they're still protected and supported. And he's going to see improved relations with China as being the key to that success. This is largely going to be headed by his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, who's really going to be his right-hand man. And even though he's his national security advisor, he's he, he's more so going to be acting as kind of like a secretary of state. He's going to go over in 1971 in a secret kind of visit to China. And then in 1972, Nixon himself will visit China. First American president to visit um, since China became communist. So this is a really big and, and kind of monumental step. This visit is going to be the kind of the first major step toward, towards a normalization of relations uh, between the United States and China. And it's going to take a little bit of time, but, you know, almost right away, they're going to start to open up trade and they're going to start to open up, you know, more diplomatic relations. And by 1979, there's going to be a complete normalization of relations with uh, the U.S. and China. So this is actually super significant, um, you know, and it's really going to open up uh, the United States to China. And and this picture, by the way, shows Nixon with uh, Mao. Mao, by the way, at this point was no longer... Uh, the premier of China, but, you know, kind of China's founding or communist China's founding father. So still kind of around, even though he had gotten kind of older up to this point. And this is kind of a lesson from Vietnam as well, which is the fact that, you know, communism doesn't necessarily have to be a threat to the United States. And, you know, Nixon embraces that. And it's one of the reasons why we see this normalization of relations. Here's Mao uh, with Henry Kissinger. Again, like I said, really um, a mastermind behind what Nixon is going to be doing. He's really going to be kind of pulling the strings. Uh, definitely Nixon's kind of right-hand man, um, especially in regards to foreign affairs. Um, here we see Nixon with the actual Chinese premier in 1972. This is uh, Zhou Enlai. And again, you know, showing, I mean, this is kind of unheard of if we think about the early Cold War period they wouldn't be in the same room together, let alone, you know, smiling, talking, working to bring about better and improve relations. And here we see Nixon, uh, again, as part of this visit. Okay, in a similar fashion, after China, Nixon's uh, foreign policy focus is going to shift over to uh, the Soviet Union, where Nixon will then visit Moscow. And at this point, again, this is a big step in the Cold War. Um, if we think about the early Cold War, no way would we expect a U.S. president and Soviet premier to be, you know, hanging out and talking. Um, and that's exactly what's going to happen out of this. The policy that Nixon largely employs with Brezhnev is one called uh, detente. And Brezhnev, by the way, is the new premier of the Soviet Union um, at this point in the 70s. And detente is an easing of tensions. And so if you think about where the Cold War has gone, we started at the beginning, which was this really high period of tension and conflict, you know, containment for the United States. And that's what really propelled them to, um, you know, use the Truman Doctrine or the Marshall Plan and then send troops into Korea um, then, if you recall, kind of slows down a little bit with peaceful coexistence after the Cuban Missile Crisis, but obviously still issues and tensions, especially when it came to something like Vietnam and whatever else. But now uh, Nixon will largely advocate this policy of detente. Let's ease tensions and let's actually work together in order to make things work and to really make the Cold War less hostile and, you know, let's be okay. So what this means is that when the two meet in the early 70s, they're going to have a trade agreement come together where trade will actually open up with the Soviet Union. And what we're also going to see is an ABM treaty that will be signed. Um, it'll, it'll come a little bit later, a ABM anti-ballistic uh, missile treaty. So you're trying to kind of slow down um, and establish limits for various um for various uh, nuclear weapons, and we especially see that with SALT, uh, which is the St Strategic Arms Limitations Treaty. Um, and this is literally meant to place limits on the amounts of nuclear weapons that both sides are able to have 
and again, slow down the arms race so it's not necessarily so lethal and so scary. Um, so that's, again, a huge, huge step um, in the right direction. With that being said, it's important to realize that even though Nixon is willing to work with the Soviet Union, he's still a very much a um, anti-communist. He doesn't trust communism. If you remember, Nixon largely came to the national attention even before he was vice president by being somebody that went after people that were communists in the early 50s, um, kind of like the McCarthy era, era. So he was still very distrustful and he still didn't want that to occur. But in the case of China and the Soviet Union, his goal was you know, more so about improving the United States' situation um, as opposed to defeating communism here. A great example of Nixon's still uh, kind of diehard attitudes and feelings uh, towards communism is with uh, what happens in Chile. Um, in Latin America, they're going to uh, have a new ruler who was kind of socialist-leaning. Uh, that's going to really grab the attention of the United States. And the and Nixon and the and the CIA is going to help assist with a coup uh, to get rid of that leader. His name Salvador Allende, and to put someone in his place by the name of um, Augusto Pinochet, who really was an awful leader and basically ruled um, with an iron fist, killing anyone opposed to him or anyone even close to opposed to him. Uh, and the U.S. definitely supported. Uh, Pinochet and his regime in Chile. Okay, again, here we see Nixon and Brezhnev uh, meeting, again, coming to some agreements here, um, all part of the greater detente. These are the nuclear limits put together uh, by SALT, and uh, you can see here, actually, they, they somewhat favor um, the Soviet Union, which is going to cause um, some tension within the United States and some um, people saying, hey, you know, why are we even doing this? You know, we're giving them a leg up. But for Nixon, for his administration, this is about really um, easing the Cold War, easing the tensions and kind of a new era of the Cold War. And this, by the way, is Pinochet uh, coming to power in the early 70s in uh, Chile, much to the help or with the help, I should say, of the United States and the CIA. Um, so that's going to be a tough situation um, that's going to develop. But nonetheless... Uh, still, this idea that in many countries, it's better to have someone who's basically a ruthless dictator, who would be Pinochet, than to have somebody that would be somewhat socialist. If you recall from 1960s uh, civil rights, um, even into 1950s, there were some pretty big things that had happened in the Supreme Court. And if you remember, since 1953, the court was what we refer to as the Warren Court because it was led by this guy in the in the front middle, Earl Warren. And he led a very kind of liberal um, court that led to a lot of monumental decisions. The one that we really discussed would be Brown versus Board of Education that officially ended segregation. I mean, what a monumental decision. And to be honest, there's going to be a lot of individual rights cases that are going to occur throughout the 1960s. So you might say, when we're on the 1970s. No, no, I, this, I'm setting the context here so you can see this, um, kind of the change that's going to occur. So let me tell you about some of these cases. Um, for example, in Gideon versus Wainwright, which is going to be 1963, this is what is going to allow everyone to have um, a legal representation, uh, like a lawyer, even if they can't afford it. So, again, before 1963, that wasn't necessarily a guaranteed right, but the Supreme Court's going to make it a guaranteed right um, in 1963 with Gideon versus Wainwright. Um, on a similar basis, Miranda versus Arizona, you might have heard of this one. This one's from 1966 because this is what leads to uh, the Miranda warning or the Miranda rights where if somebody is, in, is arrested, police officers are required to read the rights of the the accused to them. Um, and again, this is still something that exists today. Um, and, and again, these things, you might say, wait a minute, aren't these favoring criminals? Well, not necessarily. The idea here is that, again, you know, if it's going to be innocent until proven guilty and other things like that, there needs to be individual protections in play here. Um, so that's exactly what happens um, in these cases. Angle versus Vital, and uh, another one, 
which basically said um, because of the First Amendment, public schools could not require prayer um, or Bible readings and other things like that. So, um, again, this is something that is fairly known to us. Um, but at the same time, these were pretty monumental decisions that came out of the 1960s. Because of some of what was seen as kind of the radicalness of, of this, um, Nixon really, you know, he was a Republican, he was a conservative. He really wanted to change the dynamic of the court. And he wanted to put kind of a court in play that would be much more about strictly interpreting the Constitution and not really to get into social and political questions, which is largely what the Warren Court had done. So the new um, Supreme Court Chief Justice will be uh, Warren E. Berger, so it's going to be the Berger Court. Um, and, you know, Nixon's going to put some conservative appointments in there. Um, the reality is, though, the Berger Court will not necessarily act as Nixon had anticipated. Uh, they will not dismantle a lot of the liberal rulings that had come into play. They're actually going to somewhat continue with them. And probably, you know, one of the most liberal court decisions ever made was Roe versus Wade, which actually came out of the Berger Court, uh, which legalized a woman's right to abortion. Um, so, again, not exactly what Nixon had to come to hope, but really kind of a show of the Supreme Court in that even though the president makes the appointments um, and things like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Supreme Court acts in the way that the president um, anticipates. And that's a good thing. That's about separation of powers, uh, checks and balances and stuff like that. So that's, that's really promising. Uh, this is Berger, by the way. Um, who will be the new Supreme Court Chief Justice um, Nixon here. And this, by the way, I wanted to include this picture of um, Roe v. Wade protests um, and, you know, this big push uh, for abortion rights in the United States that will be granted um, in 1973. Okay, so let's talk about some things at home uh, that Nixon's going to do. Um, so first off, even though he is conservative, Nixon will increase... Uh, Social Security benefits. Um, he's going to increase uh, food stamps and Medicaid. Um, he's also going to add SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. This is uh, extra income to help people that are disabled. Um, another thing that's going to happen is in regards to affirmative action. Um, he tries to push a plan known as the Philadelphia plan, which was basically to increase um, black apprentices in construction in the hope that they could get better construction jobs, more skilled jobs, and things like that. Um, it's going to reach some backlash, but um, this was the idea to increase affirmative action. And a lot of kind of debate over affirmative action, especially in the 70s, whether or not to provide um, ease of access to jobs to uh, minority groups and, um, to, you know, college acceptances and things like that. But, you know, part of the greater civil rights, part of the idea that you have minority groups that do not have historically high levels of uh, good employment in the 1970s, you do not have high levels of um, minority groups, especially African Americans in college, so this is the idea that you help ease those opportunities for be able to, to be able to do so. So we're going to see a lot of back and forth um, in regards to whether or not to really solidify affirmative action or to kind of leave it alone. Nixon will also create the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. will um, celebrate, you know, their first Earth Day in 1970 under Nixon. So that's kind of interesting. And then if you remember, I talked at the beginning about um, health and regulation standards. A lot of that has to do with another agency that's going to be developed under Nixon, which is known as OSHA, or Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And this is an agency that is was or still is dedicated to improving working condition uh, by preventing accidents and deaths and issuing safety standards. Um, so this is a, a, an important part of trying to keep the workplace safe, especially in jobs where there is a high chance of accident, like in factories or meatpacking plants or construction, other stuff like that. 
Uh, Nixon will also take the U.S. off the gold standard officially. If you remember going back to the late 1800s with William Jennings Bryan um, and the election of 1896, that was that whole kind of back and forth about the gold standard. And it had gone away, and it was – the issue had gone away. Um, and then FDR, if you remember, he kind of uh, messed around with the gold standard a little bit. But because of some of the um, – economic issues in the early 70s, Nixon will officially take the U.S. off the gold standard um, and, and kind of changing U.S. economics at that point in time. Um, here we see the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, some pretty interesting developments are going to happen in 1972-1973. Um, so I kind of want to go through these developments with you, including the election of, eight, of 1972, uh, because what happens here is going to be pretty interesting. So first off, by 1972, war with Vietnam was still going on. And again, although um, Nixon had promised, you know, hey, I'm going to get the troops out, um, it, you know, still wanted to get the peace with honor. And so because of that, there was still fighting that was happening in order to achieve it. So as that's going on, the election of 1972 is going to come up. Republicans will put Nixon back up for re-election, and the Democrats are going to put up a guy by the name of George McGovern, um, who's the man you see here in the picture. Um, and he was out of South Dakota, and he kind of really pushed that, you know, I'm going to get out of Vietnam. I'm going to get the United States out of Vietnam and stuff like that. Okay, that might have led to some popularity for McGovern, but the reality is that was all kind of put away because McGovern was seen for many in the party as being a little too radical, um, trying to push for support from more leftist type groups um, and things like that. And so that kind of um, angered and lost him support from the more kind of working class component of the party. Um, his vice president came out had done um, psychiatric type treatment, you know, some controversial type stuff that also uh, led to a decrease in popularity. Um, so this kind of did not bode well for McGovern. And the reality is Nixon still at this point relatively popular, even though he hadn't quite got the United States out of Vietnam, people still felt that it was close. And so Nixon wins incredibly easily in 1972. I'm going to show you the map. But it's one of the biggest victories in U.S. history. So this wasn't really even close. Okay, he wins in uh, late 72. By early 73, he gets the United States officially out of Vietnam. That's all good stuff. Um, you know, again, controversy as he had really escalated bombing in the, early, in the late 60s, early 70s. But okay, you know, out in South Vietnam, technically at the time was still a legitimate place, so that made, you know, him happy, um, etc. Okay, another thing that's going to happen as far as conflict is concerned is that Syria and Egypt are going to attack Israel in 1973. This is something, again, that's going to occur, especially in the kind of 50s, 60s, 70s type period, which is Israel being attacked. Okay, a reminder, you, the United States really supports the creation of Israel in 1947, and Israel will remain, and still really is today, uh, the U.S.'s strongest ally in the Middle East. However, because Israel is a homeland for the Jewish people, it garnered, a, and still does, a lot of resentment in the Middle East. So, because of that, the United States oftentimes has had, and probably most likely will continue, to have to come to the aid of Israel because of, of attacks from Middle Eastern neighbors and things like that. So that's exactly what happens here in 1973 when Syria and Egypt decide to surprise attack Israel. In order to help Israel out, the U.S. will airlift in supplies and, help, and give them money and other things like that. And this will actually be successful in helping Israel maintain what they were doing and be okay. All right, well, this leads to anger among um, the OPEC countries who will place an oil embargo on the United States and other Western European countries that had supported um, Israel 
um, in this. Um, this leads to a big issue with the United States through this embargo, where basically there's going to be rationing and, and um, a lack of gas and oil and other things like that. And it's also a sign of something else, which is the fact that by the 1970s, the United States was consuming a lot of oil with all the cars and everything like that. But it was also a situation where the United States was really not producing very much oil for themselves. So the United States had officially really moved themselves into being a totally oil and energy dependent country. Um, so something kind of interesting to kind of look at. But what that meant was basically like a situation like this where OPEC decided to put an embargo on the United States. The United States had no real alternative other than to try to ration out gas and try to limit their gas um, numbers. So that obviously a tough situation. Okay, here's McGovern. Um, this, by the way, is your 1972 electoral map. Again, a resounding victory for Nixon. Uh, no one really anticipated that Nixon wasn't going to win, but this amount of victory obviously is, you know, pretty impressive by all um, intents and purposes um, and surprising. Um, even look at the popular vote. I mean, it's just, it's just not even close. And obviously the electoral vote, I mean, geez. And this, by the way, some of the scenes from 1973, gas shortage. Um, again, 10 gallons of gas per customer, that would be the limit. And then these are some of the other looks of other things in 1973. And you can see limit here on the price. Uh, a move to reduce the speed limit in order to help save gas. And then you see some of the lines at some of the gas stations. And this is what's going to be a reality for Americans in the 1970s during this uh, first kind of major oil crisis. There's going to be another one later on. Whenever we think about Nixon, we think about Watergate. And maybe you've already heard of Watergate before, or at least you've probably heard of the term. So let me kind of break this down for you so you can see this a little bit better and what exactly happened um, in what is probably the biggest presidential scandal in U.S. history. All right, so before the election of 1972, there were five men that were caught uh, breaking into the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. Five men arrested, um, and they were found basically trying to bug the phones um, in the headquarters and trying to figure out, you know, basically to keep an eye on Democrat strategy and other things like that before the um, election of 1972. Almost immediately, there's going to be people that are saying, listen, this seems awfully suspicious, okay? And they're going to kind of say, you know, Nixon, not the best reputation for being totally honest character, and there's going to be some people saying this has Nixon all over it. So this is going to kind of happen. So even after he wins in 1972, and again, as it shows, I mean, wins resoundingly, this is kind of lingering over as to, okay, you know, like what exactly is going on? What exactly is happening, et cetera. So a couple of things that are going to happen here. First off, we're going to see um, as all this is lingering in, Link, um, sorry, Nixon's vice president will resign, uh, Sparrow Agnew. Uh, this didn't necessarily have to do with Watergate, but it had to do with the fact that um, he was caught taking bribes while he was governor of Maryland before he was vice president and also why he was uh, vice president as well. So you can imagine this. There's already kind of scandal. There's already kind of like suspicions. And then his vice president has to resign uh, because of actual legitimate uh, corruption type stuff. Ooh. You know, that's that's dicey situation. New vice president's going to be Gerald Ford. Okay, so he comes in, obviously is in kind of a precarious situation himself, but okay, we continue on. All right, there's going to be hearings over Watergate, okay, um, investigation, etc., and Nixon will deny himself being involved. Um, well, what's going to kind of happen here is that there's going to be a pretty big belief and an accusation that Nixon was um, obstructing justice and basically trying to cover up uh, the investigation and kind of interfere with the investigation, which obviously um, is totally not allowed. 
But that's going to be kind of the thought here that he was trying to do various things in order to kind of disrupt this investigation and make sure it kind of stopped. But no necessarily concrete proof up to that. More so, you know, sneaky suspicions, other things like that. Okay, amidst the whole, you know, hearings and everything like that, it's going to be discovered that Nixon recorded, and there was a taping recording system that recorded all of Nixon's Oval Office uh, conversations. And so when that's found out, the investigators are going to say, okay, you need to hand over the tapes because those are now evidence. Nixon will refuse to hand over the tapes um, and the reason why is because he will claim executive privilege. And again, I'll put that in quotes because that's not really a real thing. Okay, if you're ordered by a court or whatever else to hand things over, you have to do so. But Nixon refuses, um, at, at least at the initial point here. This, by the way, a look at uh, Wat the Watergate Hotel in the 1970s. And here are the five men that are arrested. Okay, so what ends up happening out of this whole scene Special prosecutor put on the case and investigating Watergate, other things like that. And Nixon, you know, will refuse to hand over the tapes until finally the Supreme Court will unanimously rule that he needs to release all the tapes. When he does, one of the tapes is what we consider to be the smoking gun because it has direct evidence showing that Nixon was trying to obstruct justice and was involved in trying to cover up the investigation. You see it here when he was talking to his chief of staff um, and the fact that he tells him basically to interfere, tell them to stay out of the investigation, and then that's what Nixon or was ordering um, his chief of staff to do. And this obviously shows Nixon's direct involvement in the cover-up, no question um, here. This leads to impeachment proceedings, and it's, you know, what has to happen here as the president has misused his power, he's obstructed justice in this, um, etc. And there's belief that he did a whole lot more um, than that. However, and, and again, all this stuff, even just the obstruction of justice, would be enough to basically guarantee that Nixon would be impeached. Um, however, what's going to happen here is before impeachment proceedings really going underway, um, Nixon will announce his resignation in August of 1974. Uh, historical first here, not really a good one, but becomes the first president in U.S. history to actually uh, resign from office. Um, and again, had he not, he would have you know, been impeached. I mean, there's no question about it. Public incredibly upset, you know, couldn't believe that this is what had happened. Um, but also a sign that, you know, no person kind of above the law here and everyone need to follow the, the, the rules. Here, by the way, again, big headlines coming in when Nixon uh, resigns. And here, by the way, is kind of this famous image of Nixon as he, um, boards the um, helicopter in order to leave office. Uh, all smiles here. Um, and again, there's a reason why, but I'll get to that in just one sec. Okay, so let's talk about what happens. Okay, we have President Gerald Ford coming in. Okay, here's the thing that's interesting about Gerald Ford. Obviously, he was not elected president, but was also not elected vice president either. Okay, he had come, he had been appointed vice president after Agnew, um, had to resign because of his own corruption scandals. So now he's the president, even though he wasn't even elected vice president. And not only was there criticisms of him kind of being an idiot, but the other problem was that automatically there's just going to be illegitimacy surrounding Ford's presidency. This idea here that, you know, not only was this guy not elected president, not elected vice president either, this can't be, you know, a real thing. And so... What he's going to do pretty early on, which is going to cause a lot of anger and issues, is he's going to grant a presidential pardon to Nixon for any crimes he may have committed as president. Uh, this is going to cause also a lot of government distrust. you got to think the American people at this point, it, you know, by 1974, had seen Vietnam and they'd seen basically the president lying to them about what was going on there. 
now they've seen a president trying to obstruct justice and trying to act above the law. And then now they have a president that's given a pardon to the president that committed crimes. All right. And this really causes people to be very upset that, you know, the government would do this and more kind of of this idea that maybe the government shouldn't be very much trusted as much as it was at this point. What we'll see as far as foreign policy, Cold War is continued detente. Um, he's going to sign what's known as the Helsinki Accords. And this is another kind of uh, back and forth trade agreement uh, between the two sides, arms agreement. Um, however, Americans are not going to be nearly as excited about this one. Uh, critics saying, hey, look, there's all this grain and technology from the United States going to the Soviet Union while we're basically getting nothing in return. Um, also, you know, Soviet Union, they were told to, you know, improve their human rights records and be better. That was supposed to be part of the trade-off, but they really were not following through with that. So at this point, there's more and more people that are kind of growing unfavorable and uh, of detente and basically saying, you know what, I, I don't really think this is the best solution or the best strategy uh, for the United States to employ here. Um, again, here's headline of the pardon comes just about a month after um, Ford takes office. So, you know, pretty quick. Uh, again, a lot of issues here um, in regards to this. And here we see Ford uh, with Brezhnev, again, part of the Dayton and the Helsinki Accords. So when we were talking about the 1960s and protest, a lot of that dealing with Vietnam and civil rights movement, um, Woman definitely playing a role in both of those, um, especially civil rights movement. Um, but in the 1970s, we're going to see some kind of increased protests of their own, uh, specifically in regards to feminism. So, you know, by the 1970s, the anti-war movement had kind of settled, um, especially once the United States is out of Vietnam. Um, and what we're going to definitely see is that um, the feminism movement is going to increase a little bit. A woman feeling like this was kind of their opportunity to demand equality and, you know, mark changes. And if we think about women, you know, similar to the history of kind of African Americans, I mean, it's been, you know, it, it's been kind of a similar rhetoric and a similar history, which is that ever since the beginning, the expectation has been, um, you know, second to the man, you know, wife and mother as opposed to own kind of separate identity. And, uh, you know, we saw some, you know, we see some glimpses here and there, some progress, but not really quite there. Um, what are some of the things that are going to be victories as far as the feminism movement? Uh, 1972, we're going to get the Title IX of Education Act. Uh, this prohibits sexual discrimination in all federally um, funded educational programs or activities. What we've really seen out of this has actually been the growth of um, female college athletics uh, because Title IX has required that basically um, universities and colleges have the same number of male and female sports. So before this, we had a lot of colleges that had like one or two, but now they've had to match it. And so that's something we've definitely seen, and that's paved its, its way for the growth of like female professional uh, leagues and things like that. So definitely not quite the um, financial success of the men's professional leagues, but still something as far as progress and still good uh, that this was getting um, put into play. Roe versus Wade, um, that would be another uh, big deal for feminism a victory in that abortion was allowed. Um, so that is an interesting kind of point to this. Um, the other thing that women hope to gain off of this is what is referred to as an ERA or an Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, this ERA, they hoped, would be put into the Constitution to explicitly, um, prohibit any time of discrimination based on gender and really explicitly say that men and women were equal in all, um, facets of life and society. For some people, the move to an ERA relatively controversial, and there was going to be backlash towards the feminism movement, 
people that felt that this was really weakening the American family, this was weakening, you know, American society as a whole by doing this, even some women themselves backlashing against the feminism movement. So um, something you might not expect, but absolutely would be the case. The ERA, therefore, was defeated, um, and it still has never happened even up to this point. So maybe that will change, uh, but still nothing concrete in there. And we see some women's rights protests here for the ERA. Um, this, by the way, is a woman by the name of Phil Shafley. She was a really big opponent against the ERA and really mobilizing people against it. And I wanted to include a couple quotes as to why she was against it. Women have babies and men provide the support. If you don't like the way we're made, you've got to take it up with God. And another one here, one reason a woman gets married is to be supported by her husband while caring for her children at home. So as long as her husband earns a good income, she doesn't care about the pay gap between them. So again, um, kind of an interesting, pretty conservative viewpoint, uh, but definitely someone like Phil Shafley, a woman um, against an equal rights amendment. Interesting. Okay, race in the 1970s. Um, again, I kind of made this comment already, but affirmative action initiatives are going to be uh, controversial. For some critics, they're going to claim that uh, this is kind of a reverse type of discrimination where because white workers were denied advancement and white students uh, could be denied admission, um, that's what they were kind of claiming. So kind of a lot of back and forth as to various initiatives in that regard. Uh, but still for blacks, although you know we had Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act of 1964, certainly still inequality. And so trying to achieve equality going to be a continuing struggle. In the 1970s, what we notice is remarkable kind of success uh, for Native Americans who will take the 70s to kind of put together some pretty big civil disobedience uh, protests and uh, demonstration and other things like that. Their main goal to be a semi-sovereign people within the United States. Uh, this image, by the way, is one of their bigger protests at actually um, Alcatraz prison. And... In the Supreme Court decision of U.S. v. Wheeler in 1978, uh, Native Americans were granted unique and limited sovereignty. So this would be a big success and something that they definitely wanted. Um, the complexities of this kind of unique and limited sovereignty, you know, I mean, it is complex. But if you ever see um, that there are Native American casinos or Indian casinos, um, those are largely allowed to operate because of this Supreme Court decision. So kind of emphasizing that even in an area where casinos or gambling might not be allowed, um, that Native Americans are allowed to do that on their own uh, land. So that's the reason why we have some uh, big Native American casinos, for example, like the Pachanga or the Morongo. Okay, so let's move on into our uh, next president, our last president of the 1970s, who is Jimmy Carter. Um, here he is there. So I'll just tell you briefly what happens in the lead up uh, in, into the election of 1976. Gerald Ford is going to be put up as the Republican candidate. However, there's going to be a battle for the Republican nomination. And that challenge will come from Ronald Reagan, extremely conservative. Um, did not like Ford and almost disrupted and was almost able to ga gain the nomination. But again, kind of going back to you always put up the incumbent except in extraordinary circumstances. So Ford will go up for the Republicans. Um, for the Democrats, they're going to put up a uh, Georgia governor who was Jimmy Carter. He actually was a peanut farmer down in Georgia. And Jimmy Carter, even though was involved in politics, he was kind of seen as an outsider. He was cynical of Washington, D.C. And that was good because people at the time saw D.C. as being dysfunctional. And so they wanted somebody to come in that was a little bit from the outside and, you know, kind of was willing to acknowledge that there were issues and problems. And so that's why Jimmy Carter was um, a leading candidate here. Again, he's going to gain some popularity because of these decisions. He was also just seen as kind of a nice, down-to-earth guy who could really stand for the people in Washington, D.C., um, and that will be enough to gain him a close victory. Again, it's tight. It's not overwhelming, but he is able to win. One of the big things and one of the big reasons why Carter is actually able to win in 1976 is because of the African-American vote. 
So 11 years before this election, that was Voting Rights Act of 1965. Direct result of that huge increase in the amount of black registered voters. And they will show up to the polls in 1976 and will um, get him into a position where he's able to take the victory. So again, this is a huge impact of gaining blacks the right to vote. Okay, here we see this here. Um, for this electoral map, again, it's really, really tight. Um, and so, you know, um, it, it, it pretty, pretty significant here, just, just barely. Uh, this is, by the way, a, a, a quote Jimmy Carter says on the campaign trail, I will never lie to you. Simple, but at the same time, the people did definitely feel lied to by previous administrations. So this is the plan here. Hey, look, I'm not going to lie to you. Okay, so let's talk about um, Jimmy Carter's foreign policy, which is largely centered around human rights. And so that's going to be his major viewpoint here in order to get this together. And here you see his quote, human rights is the soul of our foreign policy because human rights is the very soul of our sense of nationhood. So that's a powerful statement. Um, he'll speak out, for example, against apartheid, which was still going on in South Africa, where the minority white population um, discriminated heavily against the majority African population. Um, Carter's biggest victory as far as human rights or foreign policy would be with the Camp David Accords. Um, Camp David Accords, he got um, Egypt and Israel to come together. Um, sign an agreement establishing peace between the nations from previous wars, protection of borders. So the idea here would there wouldn't be another kind of one of these spontaneous invasions against Israel from at least Egypt, which had led in some of the earlier conflicts. Um, so this was a big deal called Camp David Accords because Carter got the two leaders um, to come to Camp David, the presidential retreat house, and sign this monumental agreement. Uh, really powerful um, and really impressive that he was able to get this done. It is during Carter's presidency that the full diplomatic relations with China will be achieved. If you remember, um, that had started under Nixon and had been coming together. And finally, by 1979, that was there. So full diplomatic relations, full trade relations, etc. Um, and so that was, you know, good. But numerous uh, human rights abuses, by the way, by ch the Chinese government. And Carter didn't really say a whole lot about that as far as criticisms because he didn't really want to jeopardize the restorations of relations. Um, one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to sign an agreement that's going to give the Panama Canal Zone over to the Panamanians. So if you remember, that was under Teddy Roosevelt with the big stick, the creation of the Panama Canal. When they created the Panama Canal, the area inside of Panama that was directly involved with the canal, the United States uh, technically had right over that land, and Pan the Panamanians had become pretty upset. So it would finally be him that would give that zone over to the Panamanians, um, which drew actually quite a little bit of outrage from conservatives in the United States. But, you know, quite a monumental step as far as diminishing U.S. power and probably doing what was appropriate or at least what was right. Um, what we talk about and what we kind of look at when we see um, the human rights campaign from Carter is it's complex and the reality is not all countries are seen as equal. So even though he'll criticize some places, he doesn't really necessarily ever go as far as criticizing China or the Soviet Union who were the part of the bigger um issues as far as really, you know, problems and uh, issues as far as human rights were concerned. Um, here, by the way, is a look at the signing of Camp David Accords. And again, this is definitely be the big champion moment for Carter. Uh, with that being said, usually when we think of Carter, we think of a lot of problems that occurred um, for his presidency, unfortunately domestic problems, as well as foreign problems, and then a mix, actually, of the two. So never good when we have that. Okay, we're definitely going to see an increase of an inflation. So if you remember, when I first started this, I showed you this graph, but we are focused more so on the first point. Now we're on the second point, where in the, by the late 70s, inflation will reach in the United States an upwards of about 13%, which is extremely high. 
um, and you never want to see that. Um, the situation with oil is going to become more complex and more convoluted. Um, foreign trade, other things like that, going to be um, you know a, a part of this. And again, as the United States becomes increasingly you know more oil dependent. Um, these cause issues and this causes problems. Um, increased deficits we'll definitely notice as well. Um, this will mean high interest rates to borrow money. Um, you know, not exactly where we want to be. Things go from bad to worse with something that happens in Iran. And in Iran, we're going to have what's called what what's referred to as the Iranian Revolution. If you remember, and again, I only mentioned this a little bit briefly in one of the earlier lessons. In 1953, the U.S. helped orchestrate the coup of a nationalist leader in Iran who wanted to nationalize U.S. oil, um, and they got rid of that guy. His name was Mossadegh, and they put in his place a guy by the name of the Shah. And the Shah was a close ally, close friend with the United States, allowed a lot of U.S. interests to come into play, uh, was definitely dedicated to kind of the westernization of Iran, and in 1979, the people of Iran had become extremely upset with his regime. And it, his regime was repressive, by the way, and it was, you know, not a good advocate of human rights. And they, the Iranian uh, revolutionaries, decided to overthrow him. Uh, these were primarily Islamic fundamentalists who hated the Shah's attempts to westernize and modernize the country. And they saw the Shah as a representation of U.S. power. This chaos in Iran as a result of the Iranian Revolution is going to have direct results to the United States as Iranian oil will not be coming into the world markets. And so because of that, there was a shortage of oil in the world. Um, the other OPEC countries decided to increase their oil prices, which is obviously no good. Uh, this led to less supply of oil in the United States and kind of similar to 1973, but really worse, long lines at the gas stations, um, only allowed to come certain days to fill up gas, um, really just trying times um, because of this kind of situation in Iran. So certainly the American people are going to definitely blame Carter uh, for some of these issues and problems. Here, by the way, a look at the Iranian Revolution. And this, by the way, is a look in 1979 at some of our lines at the gas station. And again, this would be a, a normal everyday occurrence. And here we see this uh, oil production and we see this, um, what happens here because of um, the Iranian Revolution and also the Iran-Iraq War. That comes a little bit later, but, um, you know, big, big issues here. I'll conclude by kind of talking about how Carter's presidency ends, which is unfortunately with more problems. Carter's going to meet with Brezhnev in 1979 and create another strategic arms limitations treaty, SALT II, in order to try to limit strategic weapons for both the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, however, Congress will basically rip this up and this will not pass. And it and this has a lot to do with the fact that by 1979, the American people kind of didn't really believe in detente. Uh, they thought that the United States was giving up a lot and not getting a whole lot in return. They still didn't really quite trust the Soviet Union. So coming up with another agreement, they're going to say, forget it. Um, there's also going to be something else that occurs in Iran against the context of the Iranian Revolution, which is the Iranian hostage crisis. Um, Anti-American um, Iranians are going to come in, storm the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, um, and take all the occupants inside hostage. And um, these are Americans that are working at the embassy that are now stuck there. Um, Carter's going to try to negotiate their release, but it never really works, and they stay there for 444 days. And I'll get to this later, but they're not released until... Um, Jimmy Carter is no longer the president. So this will really be tough for his um, image. Um, in 79, the Soviet Union will invade Afghanistan, a huge oil powerhouse as well. Um, this causes issues and problems. Also, 
Uh, so much to the point where the United States will not only place an embargo on the Soviet Union, but will also boycott the 1980 Olympic Games, which were set in Moscow. So it's pretty interesting when you see something like that happen, but for Carter, just the United States would not be participating because of the Soviet Union's aggressive actions. Um, the real ruin of Carter's presidency was the Iranian hostage crisis. Uh, similar to kind of Vietnam, coverage is every single night. Uh, they showed the, you know, humiliating, uh, you know, uh, situation inside of Iran, the burning of American flags. Uh, there'd be a counter for the news that, you know, was like how many days have the hostages been there? Um, Carter, you know, made statements every once in a while, but not really effective in, kind of making the American f people feel any better about what was happening and going on. And so this really kind of failed. We think about Carter's presidency and we think about Carter as a person, nice guy. Um, you know, that's kind of the general sentiment we get about him. Um, actually, somebody after presidency that did a lot of big stuff as far as uh, human rights, peace, um, actually gain gaining a... Uh, peace prize um, after his presidency but when we think about his presidency not very good um, inherits some problems you know some other problems he doesn't probably do the best job of managing um, so his presidency you know usually in the bottom you know 50 percent easily of American presidents um, here by the way are the um, revolutionaries uh, storming the um, U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Here we see Carter, um, you know, coverage on the news trying to talk about what was going to go on and how they were going to try to get the hostages out. They do make one attempt to really try to, you know, like militarily rescue them, but it fails. And at that point on, negotiations with Carter and the revolutionaries are basically going to be worthless. And these are some of the other coverage. Again, the burning of the American flags. Uh, really huge resentment in Iran during the Iranian Revolution of the United States. And I'll just finish up by looking at uh, something I've kind of shown you before, but now let's find uh, where Jimmy Carter is. And you can see on the first one at the left, Jimmy Carter ranking in at about two, 26 um, of, the, of the presidents. And then in the other one... Um, on the right, you see him relatively uh, similar here as well um, in this bottom kind of portion. So, um, again, this is the reality of um, his presidency. And, again, nice guy, but just not quite able to get things together. And it's funny, on the one, actually on both of them, Ford is just ranked just one up from Carter. So, uh, kind of showing you what people thought of him. And, again... Ford is not very popular either, so, you know, that's the realities. Okay, thanks. Uh, hopefully this was helpful, and uh, just a couple more left. I'll do the 80s and Reagan uh, next time. Take care.